Hello there guys, what is going on? Daniel Childs back here again, another show, Let's Talk Chelsea. Going to be breaking down the latest news around Stamford Bridge today. I hope you're doing well. It's Wednesday, so breaking the back of the week now, another day closer to Chelsea's return to Premier League action and the full return of club football till the spring of 2024, which is great news. So no more concerns about players getting injured on kind of pointless international games or players returning back late, or debates around Gareth Southgate in England, because that, I mean, that really does tire me out at this point. So all of that is positive, and hopefully Chelsea do perform on Saturday. In terms of looking ahead to that Newcastle game, we'll start to focus it from tomorrow on the show. But today, going to talk about the future of Stamford Bridge. A massive piece from The Athletic was released today regarding it, and the latest info regarding that, and how much of a difficult and awkward situation it really is for Chelsea and and Chelsea's new owners. But then also Chelsea going in for another young Brazilian talent and kind of that whole recruitment strategy in that part of the world. And what does it mean for Chelsea in the long term? Then also we'll react to the loan ban that wasn't passed through when Premier League clubs had a vote yesterday, what that also means for Chelsea. So if you like the sound of that, please hit that like button. Really does help the show out. Subscribe, turn those notifications on so you don't miss any of the content as we head into probably the busiest period of the season in in the festive season, basically, for Chelsea. I mean, it always is hectic, even without European football. So we're going to be doing a lot of content as we head to the end of 2023 into 2024. So let's get into it with Stamford Bridge. I mean, I this... This subject we have discussed a lot this year, it feels like, and it is a complex one, and it's one that unfortunately just doesn't have a perfect answer. Because even if we we sort of refer to the perfect answer or the, uh, the ideal situation, at least just in my view of maybe moving to Els Court, so then you don't have to move completely away from your home for, for years and years, and you're staying in your, your local community. The reality of that actually happening feels less and less. Liam Toomey and Simon Johnson, this is their piece for The Athletic and it's very much posing the question, Stamford Bridge, stick or twist? So firstly, in terms of if Stamford Bridge could be uh, sort of remodeled stand by stand or demolished, this is what they had to say. In either case, feasibility will be a greater consideration than cost. The unique challenges of fitting a larger capacity stadium into a tight 11.9 acre plot of land bordered on two sides by train lines have been extensively documented and are well known to the ownership. Abramovich's non-negotiable requirement for any Stamford Bridge rebuild was 60k seats, a significant increase on the current 40k capacity. Bowley and Clear Lake are of the same mind and while they have no such aspirations to emulate the previous owner by building a Westminster Abbey style cathedral of football, there is a strong feeling that a new home should at least match the standard set by Tottenham Hotspur across the city regarded by many as the finest modern club arena in Europe I mean it kind of gets sick in your mouth saying that but I mean it is an impressive stadium uh, but I think Chelsea could make a better one Chelsea as well will examine all of the viable temporary stadium options in the event of a Stamford Bridge rebuild but Bowley and Clear Lake do not consider nearby Craven Cottage to be one of them with a projected capacity of 29,000 when the new Riverside Stadium fully opens next uh, Riverside Stand, sorry, fully opens next year. Fulham's home is regarded as simply too small and relatively lacking in corporate amenities to fulfil the brief. I'm sure for a lot of fans that isn't kind of the biggest consideration, but apparently is one. This feels very 2014 for years. I mean, now we're getting references in this piece to Twickenham and even West Ham's London Stadium. Could you imagine that? Which is uh, quite ridiculous. But these are all the options. And I do want to bring this up in terms of Ells Court because then they do move on to the potential of Chelsea moving to Ells Court and what that could potentially mean. But there is so much within that, so many ifs that make it far-fetched because I know that the the Ells Court development site, they've kind of responded in recent months to say there isn't any contact with Chelsea. There's nothing even close to being done with Chelsea. We're moving ahead with basically building a load of flats uh, within the centre of London. And as the piece stresses, even if Bowley and Clear Lake could acquire the Ells Court site, they would need to convince a 76% majority of the Chelsea pitch owners, shareholders, to sanction a permanent move away from the bridge, owning the freehold to the current stadium site, as well as the license to the name Chelsea Football Club, gives the CPO 
an effective fan veto to any plan to take their club away from their historic home. They do bring up this graphic in terms of like the geography of in terms of where else court is, where Stanford Bridge is. This is a point I've made before and why Ells Court seems like a, an amazing place if you don't want to move away from your home. Now, my argument then was like, I don't think it's like betraying Chelsea because it keeps us within the area where Stanford Bridge is. And I think people's match day experiences wouldn't be that altered. But I think for now, we have to be realistic. And I know Baku Brian are great. Chelsea Twitter account was referencing a, a recent Chelsea fan cast episode where they discussed this in detail. And actually, the idea of Els Court, I mean, just even more sort of trashing that that's even a possibility. So although we can talk about it as a plan B, I mean, I'm not sure even sure if it's realistic. We know Chelsea recently acquired that site from Stoll, um, just right next to the Britannia Gate, where it is going to be used to build something in the future. But that it was said at the time, I believe by Nizar Kinsella and reporting by others, that that doesn't necessarily mean that Chelsea are going to stay in that location, which is a little bit strange to me, but that was also something relevant to Stamford Bridge and the future of it. Some I've even seen that I respect within the Chelsea community have sort of said that, you know, do we even need to redevelop Stamford Bridge? I do think things have to evolve at, at times, as much as I love and cherish Stamford Bridge the way it looks right now. The stadium has developed through history as Chelsea have evolved and the idea that it can't evolve again if Chelsea want to compete at the highest level I think there is just a harsh reality that when you look at our competitors are either in the case of Liverpool very much building on um, the current site in Anfield of, of developing that stadium to look more modern or in the case of Arsenal and Tottenham London based have completely moved stadiums and it's difficult and it's a difficult transition process, but it is one that I think will will happen sometime in the future. But even with, I think, this current ownership's their ambitions, which very much was the case when they were, you know, in the running to to own Chelsea, it's not a, a simple fix. It is it's a and it, it, it this once again kind of proves to you why Abramovich didn't get it over the line. And why we have so many discussions about it, because given where Chelsea are based, you know, I, I was at the Football Content Awards and that took place at Anfield. I'm always amazed when I go to stadiums, especially outside of London, how much space there is compared to where Stamford Bridge. I mean, Stamford Bridge is really packed in. It's a very unique stadium in that sense. Let me know your thoughts as ever. I know they're going to be uh, different and I know they're going to be complex, but uh, definitely also suggest read up uh, on, on as much of it as you can. And I think the, the article itself gives a lot of detail historically too of, of what's happened before, where we are now and potential options in the future. Moving on now to some transfer news. Uh, Nazar Kinsella was on the London is Blue podcast. As I always say, please go and listen and support their show. Within it, he talked about some potential transfer targets. One of those was Gabriel Moscardo, who is a young Brazilian talent. Apparently, Chelsea are seriously in for him. He's a Corinthians midfielder in Brazil, and Chelsea have already tried to bid for him, but the player is happy to wait and see his options. The reason I wanted to just bring this up is really regarding what the plan is for a lot of these young players and my initial reaction to it on X was just why. Because you go through the list of young players Chelsea continue to recruit. Kendry Piaz had a decent night for, for Ecuador last night. I believe he assisted a goal. He's 16. Ridiculous age given you know where he's playing and the level he's playing at. But then you look at other players, some of whom were involved in our preseason, the likes of Andre Santos, Cesare Cassidy, and Mari Hutchinson having a great time of it at Ipswich this season. Diego Marrero, who has gone on loan to Leon. There are others too I'm probably missing out. My concern with all of this is just stacking all these players up. Is it solely like, do we need to stop looking at these players as ones for the future of Chelsea's first team and actually just for the future of the multi-club model, whether that be Strasbourg or other teams that Chelsea look to acquire in the future? That's my belief because all these players, the idea that all of them are going to make it is unrealistic, but it just feels a little bit farcical to me that these all of these players are being bought solely for the purpose of returning to Stamford Bridge one day. If you only have a handful of multi-club, you know, other clubs, satellite clubs, whatever you, the, the crew term you want to use, even then, if Chelsea continue to invest on youngish players within the current first team, 
I mean, the pathway, we talk about pathway mainly when we're referring to Cobham, but the pathway for those players as well seems unrealistic and it's going to be tricky. It really is. So I'm I'm just a little bit baffled and a little bit tired of all these stories uh, because I, I don't see, especially for young players, that route being that that simple and that coherent. And I think that there is maybe more at play here in terms of stocking up players potentially to send them to other clubs that Chelsea may acquire. I did do a piece, my my latest piece. It's not, I think, the latest fanzine. It's not in, in the latest fanzine piece, but the one for October was talking about the multi-club model. And my opinions on it, as I, the more I've thought about it, the more I've seen it, is is a lot more negative in terms of what it means for that local community. In the case of Strasbourg, we've seen the the protest against the multi-club model and uh, specifically Todd Bowley and Chelsea. And it just seems to annoy clubs within that. And it, and it kind of does feel more and more, if you're not the Leipzig model, uh, oh, sorry, the RB model, Red Bull have really mastered that. If you're not that, I, I do think it kind of becomes a little bit of a pyramid scheme where the club at the top of it, be that Chelsea, be that Man City, are going to be the only ones to benefit from it, really. And I just don't see as a supporter what it does to improve my experience going to see Chelsea. In some ways, it just slightly denigrates it in a way because then I start to think about what those Strasbourg fans are thinking right now and it makes the club actually look a little bit shallow and like they're going in just to extract some value back to Chelsea. So that's my concerns. Maybe I'm being really harsh and negative. Let me know your thoughts. You may disagree. But I think all these players, some of them are just going to end up at multi-club models or eventually turn a profit uh, because I just can't see all of them making it. The final thing to speak about is is slightly linked, actually very much linked to associated clubs. And it's uh, Premier League clubs have voted against a ban on loan deals between associated clubs as the January transfer window approaches. Apparently, clubs voted 13 to 7 in favour of a ban, but the threshold to pass was 14. So it didn't go through. Sky Sports in their piece on this listed out sort of the clubs within the Premier League of having connections. And it's probably more than you suspect when you talk about multi-club, when you talk about associated clubs, probably people will pick out Newcastle, they'll pick out Chelsea with Strasbourg and they'll pick out Manchester City. But there's a lot more. Arsenal have an agreement with Colorado Rapids in America, Aston Villa, uh, Vittoria Sport the Club, ZFC and Vissel Kobe, Bournemouth FC Lorient. Newcastle, unsurprisingly, Al Nasir, Al Ali, Al Itihad, and Al Halal. Nottingham Forest have Olympiacos. Sheffield United have also Al Halal. West Ham, Sparta Prague, and Manchester United, if the Sir Jim Radcliffe investment goes through, will have Nice as part of one of their associated clubs. So there's a lot there. 442 did kind of a jokey Newcastle related graphic today in terms of the potential 11 they could have after January if they get all these loans in and that includes Cristiano Ronaldo, Kareem Benzema, Milinkovic Savic, Ruben Neves and I'm Eric Laporte. I mean it's it that is kind of taken to its extreme. But again it's it kind of proves what I've been saying in recent days when we're talking about charges and the you know the Premier League sort of regulation. It's it's much wider than people think and it's I do think this is just the way the Premier League is now and clubs with associated ones, obviously see the benefits of it for player development, for player trading potentially. Uh, I will be curious in the case of not really Chelsea, because we know Strasbourg, we've got Angelo there this season. We will probably maybe send some youngsters there. I could see that. Maybe even some fringe players midway through this season. You know, could you even see a situation where, say, a Noni Manawake ends up at Strasbourg because he's barely got any football at the first half of this season? That seems like a far-fetched one. But at the same time, I could see that also being a way we use multi-club is is sending players who aren't getting football, maybe need to go for at least five to six months to to get themselves some playing time at at a decent level. But then also Newcastle, I think the interest obviously will be with them in terms of players coming in the opposite direction, the likes of Ruben Neves, who only moved this past summer. Let me know your thoughts. I mean, again, I'm not it's kind of a shrug of the shoulders. Uh, I, I think that in terms of it, it obviously benefits Chelsea that they have that opportunity. 
but then also the the whole multi-club model itself that discussion point is something that is a concern for people and i understand why of what it means for the future of football and what individual clubs within their communities actually mean if they're just deemed as satellite clubs to potentially bigger clubs and does that sort of extract value and purpose and actual the, the unique sense that each club has despite their size and success so let me know your thoughts on all of that you can follow me across socials at son of chelsea we'll be back from tomorrow starting to look ahead to that game against newcastle at the weekend and i will see you again very soon all the best